Hey, how you doing, econ students? This is Mr. Clifford. It's time for a super quick review of all of macroeconomics. I have this big poster. All the concepts are all here somewhere. So let's jump into it. We're looking at scarcity. Scarcity is the first question in the test. It's usually talking about unlimited wants and limited resources. The test also might talk about trade-offs or opportunity costs. The big trick in unit one, though, is the idea of the production possibilities curve. I want you to remember, a bowed out curve shows increasing opportunity cost and the law of increasing opportunity cost. And a constant or straight line production possibilities curve shows constant opportunity cost. This one, the resources produced the two products are completely different. And this one, the resources are very similar. Now we're going to talk about economic systems. There's three different types, command economies, free market, and mixed economies. Right? In the free market, individuals own the resources, and there is private property. In the command economy, the government owns the resources, and there's no private property. Right? The production possibilities curve also shifts. There's three things that shift the curve, quantity of resources, technology, and trade. Talking about trade, a key concept you're going to see on the macro exam is comparative advantage. Right? You set up the country on the left and the products in the very top, and you calculate how much is the per unit opportunity cost for one country in terms of the product they could have produced. So down here, if China can produce five cars or 15 food, each one car costs them three food, and each one food costs them one third of a car. Remember, the country that has the lower opportunity cost has therefore a comparative advantage. So in this situation, the United States should produce cars because they only give up one food for each car they produce, and China gives up three food for each car they produce. Down here is the circular flow. This is the big picture of the entire economy. It has the product market and the resource market. We have firms and individuals. Individuals buy goods and services from businesses in the product market. So the individuals demand and businesses supply. But in the resource market, the individuals supply their land, labor, and capital, and the businesses demand that land, labor, and capital. All right, now it's time to jump into unit two, supply and demand. Of course, we've got equilibrium, equilibrium. We understand the idea that if the price is too low, there's a shortage. If the price is too high, there's a surplus. Each of these situations, we result in deadweight loss. For example, if there is a price ceiling, ceilings go below, we result in deadweight loss because we're not producing the amount society wants. And of course, the price floor, floors go above, again, it would cause deadweight loss. Another key concept is the idea of shifting the curve. There's the five shifters demand, the six shifters supply. Make sure to draw on a free response what happened to price and quantity when you draw a shift. There's substitutes and complements, as you know. When the price of one goes up and the demand for the other one goes up, that must make them substitutes. This means it has a positive cross-price elasticity demand coefficient or a negative cross-price elasticity coefficient for complements. Income and uh, normal and inferior shows the idea that if income goes up and people buy more of something, it's a positive income elasticity coefficient, and so that means it's a normal good. A negative income elasticity coefficient, if income goes up and people buy less of something, they're inferior goods. All right, the rule for double shifts, when two curves shift at the same time, something is going to be indeterminate. The one that's indeterminate is one that looks the same. So shift the curve and look at whatever looks the same, that's actually indeterminate because it depends on the severity of the shift. Talking about the idea of elasticity, when the elasticity demand coefficient is zero, that means demand is perfectly inelastic, like the demand for insulin. Gasoline is less than one, inelastic. Horizontal or a 45 degree angle, although it's not really, but you can understand the idea, is a unit elastic. Flat is elastic. And then there's horizontal, which is the idea of perfect competition. They have a horizontal demand curve. Now, as you know, this shows the idea of elasticity. You also can find elasticity, instead of using that equation, you can use the total revenue test. So if you remember, if the price goes up and the total revenue also goes up, in other words, the size of this box get bigger, because the price goes up, people buy a little bit less, and total revenue goes up, it's inelastic demand. It looks like an I. Price up, total revenue up, look like an I. Price down, total revenue down, it looks like an I. If the price goes up and total revenue falls, well, notice, quantity is always going to fall, but quantity fell by a whole lot. So the box got smaller. Price goes up and total revenue falls. That means that must be elastic demand. If price goes up and total revenue stays the same, that must be unit elastic demand. There's also the utility maximizing rule, which is the margin utility per dollar. So if I was given a choice of buying different things, I have to figure out what's my additional satisfaction for the next unit, divided by the price of that product, and keep buying the one that gives me the most utility per dollar until I run out of money. The last concept is the idea of taxes. When there's a decrease in the supply from taxes, the price goes up and the quantity goes down. But the price consumers pays goes up and the price producers get actually falls. Why? Because there's a tax in between them, a tax wedge. And so right now the new price is 10, 
But since this is a $5 tax, the new price that producers actually get to keep is only five. So that $5 times 10 is that box of tax revenue. This is consumer surplus after the tax. This is dead weight loss, assuming no externalities. This yellow box represents the revenue firms get to keep. And this total box right here is the total spending on cigarettes. So again, if there's a tax, then there's this new box that people actually spent. Some go to the firms and some go to the government. Now in unit three, things got crazy. We started talking about all different types of cost curves and stuff. So let's go over this. The first concept that you need to know is the law of diminishing marginal returns. As you hire more and more workers or a variable resource, and you only have a fixed number of fixed resources, the additional output will eventually fall. And this is the graph that shows it. Marginal product goes up, goes down, goes negative. That means the total product goes up at an increasing rate because of specialization, goes up at a decreasing rate because of fixed resources, and eventually starts to fall. All right? That's the idea of diminishing marginal returns. Now, that concept shows you the shape of the marginal cost curve. Since each worker produces more than the previous worker, then the marginal cost is going to fall for those units. So the MP goes up, that means the marginal cost always starts off by going down. When each worker produces less than the previous worker, then the marginal cost of those units will start going back up. There's also a long run cost curve, and it shows you right here, a long run average cost curve. Economies of scale is when your average costs are falling because you're getting bigger and better and then they level out, that's called cost returns of scale, and eventually your costs go back up again, that's called diseconomies of scale. After we learned that, we talked about the idea of perfect competition, which is this graph right here. We've got supply and demand, the graph we learned back in unit two. Now this is a firm, in this case making profit, it's a price taker, demand equals MR, you produce where MR equals MC, there it is, down to the ATC, they're making profit, and over, notice it's not down to here, it's down to right here, that's the box of profit. Right. In the long run, eventually firms are going to enter. That means the supply curve would shift to the right, lowering the price right down here. So it ends up looking like this graph. It's not here. Crap. So the quantity will go down for the firm and will be in long run equilibrium where there's no economic profit. Now I want you to remember, no economic profit means accounting profit is still positive. All right, there's a couple things you need to remember. Right here is not the shutdown rule. Right? The shutdown rule is minimum AVC, not ATC. And so the marginal cost curve is a supply curve, but only a portion above ABC. Another key concept you need to remember is the idea when the marginal cost is below the average total cost, it pulls down the average total cost. So anytime the marginal cost is down here, it's pulling down the average. When the marginal is above the average, it pulls the average back up again. It applies to ATC and ABC. A firm making a loss looks like this. We produce where MR equals MC, again it's a price taker. The ATC is above, and so that means it's a loss. So that box right there is a loss. Again, firms would leave, supply would shift to the left, and get the price back up to long run equilibrium. Now what's not up here is the idea of how many units to produce. If the question gives you the fixed cost and the variable cost, and it gives you the price, you have to be able to figure out how many units should I actually produce with that information. Another thing you have to be able to do is calculate average cost, average variable cost, and average total cost. So make sure you can do that. Down here, I have the characteristics of the four market structures. Perfect competition, monopolist competition, oligopoly, monopoly. The AP test will ask you questions about the most important thing that makes it completely different. So for perfect competition, we know there's many small firms, but the thing that makes it different is it's a price taker with identical products. Monopolist competition has differentiated products or slightly different products. Oligopolies use game theory or interdependence, and a monopoly has a unique good with no competitors. So there's only one firm producing. Remember, there's high barriers in monopolies and oligopolies with low barriers for monopolist competition, perfect competition. So they have no economic profit here, but they do have accounting profit, right? No economic profit for perfect competition, monopolist competition, but they do have positive accounting profit. Let's go look at monopolies. Now, in unit four, we talked about imperfect competition, which is monopolist competition, monopolies, and oligopolies. The most important graph is right here. It's the monopoly graph. Remember, it looks like this. There's the demand and the marginal revenue. To sell another unit, they got a lower price of the next unit, and the previous unit, they could have sold for a higher price. So the demand is not horizontal and is not equal to the marginal revenue. A firm will always produce when the marginal cost hits the marginal revenue, so a monopoly produces here, and charge the price up to demand. Keep in mind, right here, demand equals supply is where perfect competition would produce. And so monopoly charges a higher price and produces a less output. They also have dead weight loss, which is right here at yellow. In this graph, I have a box of profit. Remember, firms cannot enter because there's high barriers. That is the long run graph and the short run graph. The AP test might ask you about maximizing total revenue, which is right here. When the MR hits zero, total revenue is at a max. This is the elastic and the inelastic range of the demand curve. If the government tries to regulate a monopoly, we've got a socially optimal, which is where society wants produced, where there's no debate loss, 
or they can try doing a price ceiling at a fair return where it's breaking even, there's no economic profit. Now is a good time to talk about the difference between a per unit tax and a lump sum tax. If there's a per unit tax on a monopoly, the marginal cost would increase, right? It's a tax. And so the price would go up and the quantity would go down. If there's a lump sum tax on a monopoly, nothing happens. The rule is a lump sum affects fixed costs and therefore quantity does not change. Price and quantity don't change because marginal cost doesn't change when there's a lump sum tax or a lump sum subsidy. However, when there's a per unit tax or a per unit subsidy, price and quantity will change because marginal cost will change because it affects variable costs. So a per unit tax will shift the marginal cost, but a lump sum tax will not affect marginal cost, price and quantity stay the same. Another graph that might ask me to draw is a monopoly with a loss. Same exact graph, demand, marginal revenue, produce, MR equals MC, same price. Only thing that's different is the ATC. Also keep in mind the deadweight loss is still there exactly the same. You do not need the ATC to figure out deadweight loss. It has nothing to do with profit. It has everything to do with efficiency. The next graph is monopolist competition. Right? It's kind of like perfect competition except it still has a downward sloping demand and marginal revenue. The thing that makes it similar to perfect competition is no economic profit because of low barriers. That means the ATC goes down, hits a sweet spot, keeps going down, then goes back up, and it makes no economic profit, but it does make positive accounting profit. Right? There's deadweight loss, and there's something else called excess capacity. They're, they should be, and they could produce at minimum ATC, but they're not. They're holding back production to make as much profit as they can, at the very least breaking even. If they produce any other quantity, they'd be making a loss. The other concept is the idea of an oligopoly. The oligopoly and game theory, they might ask you about the graph, like a colluding oligopoly, which is a cartel, which is just a monopoly. Or they could ask you a game theory question, which is the whole idea of Nash equilibrium or a dominant strategy. Remember, a dominant strategy is a thing you should do regardless of what the other firm does. So in this case, for James, if Avery goes high, he can choose between getting 30 or he can go 20. Which one is he rather going to do? Well, he's rather going to go 30. And if Avery goes low, he can choose between 40 and 30. So James will always price high because those options are better than anything else he could do. That's his dominant strategy. So no doubt about it, James has a dominant strategy in pricing high right there. Now in the other case, if James goes high, Avery can choose between going 20 or 30, she'd rather go low. Or she can go 30 or 10, she'd rather go high if James goes low. And so she does not have a dominant strategy. Sometimes she goes high, sometimes she goes low, and that's where they'll be. A Nash equilibrium is where they're going to end up. If James prices high, always, because that's his dominant strategy, Avery can get $20 at 30, she'd rather be getting low and getting $30. So right here is their Nash equilibrium. That's where they're going to end up every single time. Now in unit five, we're talking about the resource market or the supply and demand for resources, land, labor, and capital. The first concept we have to remember is derived demand. The demand for resources depends on the products they produce. So the demand for cheese is a resource, demand depends on the demand for pizza. All right, there's MRP and MRC. MRP is the additional revenue generated from another resource. MRC is additional cost. That creates this graph. This is a perfectly competitive resource market and firm hiring workers. We've got demand and supply. Remember, demand is done by firms. Supply is done by individuals. It sets a wage. That firm is a wage taker. That wage is the MRC, not the demand. It's the supply. Each worker generates eventually less output, and so the revenue they are generating goes up because of specialization. Then each worker generates less revenue. This is the MRP. It goes down. You hire where MRP equals MRC. There's no profit box. There's no other concepts. That's it. That's all. You hire where MRP equals MRC. Perfectly competitive resource market and firm. The way to do it, you have to be able to do this concept is if I give you a price and the total product quantity of workers, you have to be able to calculate uh, the number of workers you should hire, and we should calculate the profit. So that concept may or may not be on the test. Another thing is the actual graph for the market itself. In this situation, we have demand supply for carpenters. If there's a minimum wage, which is above equilibrium, this is a wage floor, that's going to cause the client supply to go up, the client demand to go down, it's going to cause unemployment. All right, the last graph is a monopsony. This is a monopoly for labor. Only one firm is hiring. Instead of looking like a monopoly, a monopsony looks like this. There's a supply curve, and the MRC is greater because they have to increase the wage of the next worker and the previous worker they could have hired for a lower wage. The point is they hire where MRP hits MRC, which is there, but they pay people a lower wage than they normally would in perfect competition. They've never asked for this graph on a free response, but the concept they might ask you in a multiple choice. A monopoly, I'm sorry, a monopsony is a monopoly for labor. All right, the last unit in microeconomics is unit six, market failures. The first concept you need to understand was public goods. 
if we're up to the free market, we wouldn't have enough public goods like free schools and national defense and things like that because of two things, non-exclusion and shared consumption. Public goods have a lot of free riders because it's impossible to exclude people. That's called non-exclusion. And when one person uses it, other people can use it. That's called shared consumption or something called non-rivalry. Those are the two characteristics of true public goods. All right, we talked about taxes as well. There's three types of taxes, proportional, regressive, and progressive. A progressive tax has a higher percent of income for rich people, like our national federal income tax system. A regressive tax, like a sales tax, is a set amount. It's like $1 is more for a poor person than for a rich person. That's called a regressive tax. And proportional is like if everyone paid 10% of their income as income tax, that's proportional. Great. The next concept you learned was the idea of tax incidence, which I show you down here. All right. I have different shapes of the demand curve. Right? Vertical demand, super steep, inelastic demand, perfectly inelastic demand, unilastic demand, elastic demand, and perfectly elastic demand. The elasticity of demand coefficients are zero, less than one, one, greater than one, and then uh, undefined. What I want you to notice in each one of these situations, I've drawn the tax box that we did back in unit two. In these situations, you can tell the entire tax right here is paid by consumers. In this situation, most of the tax is paid by consumers. Here, they share the tax equally. Here, most of the tax is paid by producers. And here, all the tax is paid by producers. So the rule is, as the demand becomes more inelastic, consumers pay more and more of that tax. And as the demand becomes more elastic, producers will pay more of that tax. So that's it right here. Tax incidents, consumers pay more when the demand is inelastic. When it's elastic, producers pay more of the tax. Now, the next concept you did was negative and positive externalities. This is the idea that there's external costs or external benefits to other people. A negative externality means we're at supply and demand. This is what you saw back in unit two. That's what the free market makes, but it's in the wrong spot. This is the marginal private cost. There's an additional marginal social cost on society because there's a spillover cost to other people. That's the marginal social, that's an S, social cost. That means we should be producing that quantity socially optimal, but we're not. And so we're producing too much in the free market when there's a negative externality. That means the deadweight loss is right here. In a positive externality, there's additional benefits to other people. And so the free market is producing too little. It's not factoring in all these other benefits to other people. So there's a second uh, benefit curve. This is the marginal private benefit. This is the marginal social benefit. So right here, that's the quantity socially optimal. So that's the deadweight loss because we're not producing more like we should. The solution for these are to tax a negative externality and to subsidize a positive externality. But I want you to remember a per unit tax, not a lump sum. A lump sum would not affect the quantity. A per unit tax on negative externality would change this private cost. It would become the same as the marginal social cost, solving the problem. A per unit subsidy would cause us to produce more over here and produce, make us produce quantity socially optimal so there's no deadweight loss. All right, that's the whole idea of unit six. I just summarized all of microeconomics. Remember, there's several key graphs that you absolutely need to know. Number one, make sure you can draw a monopoly, profit, and loss. Also show socially optimal, fair return, consumer surplus, producer surplus, all in that one graph. Also, make sure you know perfect competition, side-by-side -side graphs showing a market and a firm. Also, make sure you know how to draw a regular supply and demand graph showing ceilings and floors and shifts on that curve and the idea of taxes. Also, make sure you know monopolist competition in the long run when there's no economic profit. Also, make sure you know perfectly competitive firms in the resource market and negative and positive externalities. The biggest advice I can give you is always draw the graph. And so when you get the AP test, take it, flip it upside down. When they say go, draw out those key graphs. When you come across questions, go back to the actual graph and check out the graph and you'll get the right answer particularly things like questions that talk about marginal cost and average total cost. Just draw the graph and look at the graph. It'll give you the right answer. Till next time.